Okay, as promised, it is 1215. We are going to get started. Thank you all for joining. And if you did not catch in the chat, we, or look at your radar, <laughs> if you're joining from Pinellas County, we are about to get a storm. So this is my fair warning. If I disappear, I will do my best to come back, but it's possible we lose power. I am based here at Booker Creek Preserve in Tarpon Springs in the swamp. So <laughs> we're known for losing power in storms. So I'm gonna jump right in because we wanna keep this as a lunch and learn. I have a lot to cover, which it helps if I advance my slide. First and foremost, this is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel in a week or two. And if you feel in any way, shape or form that we have discriminated in the promotion of this presentation or during my presentation, there are ways you can file a complaint through the USDA who funds portions of our salary at UF IFAS Extension. That being said, we do have closed captioning available. I see that some of you have turned that on. That is a feature at the bottom of your screen that you can toggle on and off as you see fit. Before we jump in though, quickly, who am I talking to you about trees? <laughs> Again, my name is Lara Milligan. I am the natural resources agent. I work for UF IFAS Extension in Pinellas County. I've been in this role for 12 years now, which is crazy. <laughs> Time is flying by. I am a Florida native. I love trees, hence this presentation. And I am a graduate of the University of Florida. I did both, both my undergrad and graduate degree there, focusing on forestry, natural resource conservation. So. That's really where my love of trees started, and I hope to share some of that with you today. And please also let me know if you have any issues hearing me as this storm happens, just keep it, um, chime in on the chat, which is another feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, I will be answering those at the end of the presentation, but if you don't want to forget it, please use the Q&A feature also at the bottom of your screen or top, depending where your menu is, and type your question in there so you don't forget it. All right, so we're gonna jump in. Again, there's a lot to cover. These are the categories that we are gonna be going through today. And these categories can get very, <laughs> there will be many sub bullets to these categories once we get into it. So we're gonna talk about range, habitat, bark, leaves, twigs, flowers, fruits and seeds. Again, this is an introduction. So we're just kind of giving you like the overview of everything that you need to know. And if you wanna nerd out, you will have to do that on your own time. My hope is that all of the characteristics that we go over, which there will be many, that you can at least remember four of them. Okay, that's your goal for today. So is everyone ready? If anyone chimes in in the chat that we're ready, I'm gonna kick this thing off and we are gonna learn all about introduction to tree ID. All right. Kelly's ready, so everyone's ready. <laughs> First and foremost, I mentioned range. This is the area where a tree is naturally found or naturally occurring. So what you see on your screen is something called a range map. Now this might seem basic, but it's very, very important information. So for example, if you are out in California and you think that you are looking, so this is the range map for a loblolly pine. If you think you're looking at a loblolly pine out west, I'm gonna very kindly say, I think it's a different type of pine because they are not found out west. Now the scale at which range maps are, I guess, shown to you can vary depending on what resource you are using. So this one broadly puts it into, if it's found anywhere in the state, it colors the state green, it could be found here. Sorry, my advancer is not working. Okay, but this is the same range map for the same, well, another range map for the same species that kind of hones in a little bit more specifically on where this tree is found. So now when we zoom in here, again, if you were down in South Florida and said, oh, I think I'm looking at a loblolly pine, I'm gonna say, well, probably not. So again, just knowing where the species is found throughout the country, throughout the state is very, very important. And there are big changes from North Florida to even Central and South Florida. Then after you've identified your range, okay, this could be found here. You really wanna hone in on the habitat, the surrounding area where you're seeing this tree. 
this kind of highlights the two extremes that we have here in Florida. We're known for our swamps. So if you're in a really, really wet environment, you see standing water or it seems like mucky soil, there's gonna be different tree species that can be found there and can tolerate those conditions compared to something like a high scrubby sand pine sand hill habitat where it's very hot, very dry, right? So you're not gonna ever see the tree we see on the left, a cypress tree growing in a sandy sand hill habitat. And the opposite's also true. You're not gonna find a sand pine emerging from a standing body of water. So just again, observing your surroundings, the habitat where the tree is growing will be helpful in identification. Okay, that was like the warm up. It's gonna, I promise it's gonna get a little more intense. So I'm just, so everyone, we've we're got range, we've got habitat. And now it's gonna get fun, bark. This is one of my personal favorite things because if any of you have ever tuned into my colleague James Stevenson's classes on plants, this is something that are generally speaking, plants kind of lower to the ground do not have, but it's a critical, critical characteristic and feature of trees that we can utilize, especially this time of year when not all of our trees have leaves. So again, something we might not often think about, just walk past, disregard. I'm telling you, do not. And you can totally have fun with my colleague in Michigan State. He does something on, I believe, just Twitter or X, sorry, whatever it's called now. I, I, I can't keep up. So his um, handle is at the top and he does something called barking up a tree where he literally will just post a picture of the tree's bark and gives you X amount of time to identify the tree simply by the bark. And it's really fun. I promise as you kind of focus in on this, this will be something that you also will get better at, even just generally categorizing it. Is it a rough bark? Is it a smooth bark? Is it a flaky bark? So this kind of shows some of the key differences that we might see when it comes to bark. You can have different, again, textures, colors. There's also something called lenticels. The presence or absence of those can be helpful in identification. So smooth bark here on the top left, I'd be willing to bet a lot of you could even guess B just by looking at this bark. So this is from a live oak tree. Then we have C, this is kind of more of a flaky bark. This is with, um, you'll see with a sycamore tree, which we do have here in Pinellas County. Then um, down on the bottom, we have different, this is sh the sugarberry tree, which we also have here. It's kind of got like this, these quirky little particles sticking out of the bark. Again, very, very helpful in identification. And then these little slashes, you can see they're pointed to here as lenticels. The presence or absence of these, again, can be helpful. Their purpose we'll talk about a little bit later on, but there's no real rhyme or reason as to why some trees have them, others don't. If you wanna get your PhD, plenty of opportunities for research there. So this is honing in on the lenticels a little bit more, just to kind of note that depending on the age of the tree, this really goes for lenticels or not, the bark of a tree can really change from kind of a young, not mature tree to a larger, fully mature tree. It will change over time, just like we change over time. So just, again, that's something to keep in mind because when you're trying to identify different um, field guides, we'll say younger bark looks like this, mature bark will look like this. So just knowing or taking your best guess at, is this a young tree or is this a mature tree can, can be helpful for, for identifying. So you can see darker bark, lighter lenticels. This is the same species. Then when it's a mature, it kind of has a lighter bark and the lenticels are a little bit darker and they become a little bit more horizontal compared to the dotted appearance when they're young. Now, okay, so that was bark. <laughs> and again, we could dive into a lot, of, a lot of these a lot more. This is everything. I mentioned all the sub bullets. So this is where you like buckle up, take another sip of coffee, whatever you gotta do. I'm clearly well off on my coffee, but <laughs> this is what we're gonna go over with when it comes to leaves persistence, structure, and you'll know what all these mean when I'm done. Complexity, arrangement, shape, margins, tips and bases, venation, surface, and taste or smell. Okay, so here we go. 
And a lot of these will make sense once we get into it. It's just terminology. When we're talking about leaf persistence, and I already alluded to this before, here we're just simply talking about evergreen versus deciduous. Evergreen meaning it's green year round. It retains its leaves year round. This is often with our conifers. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So think um, our pine trees. They do lose their needles, but they're green year round. Compared to our deciduous trees, so a lot of them are either kind of naked, like this picture you see now, they've lost all their leaves, or they're in the process of doing that. So think red maple. I have one in my front yard, constantly, constantly dropping leaves right now. So just knowing that, and this is a great time of year to note that, can be really helpful and kind of categorize what species you're, or broadly, some categories of trees that you might be looking at. Now, when we get into the structure of the leaf, this is really important once you get into the details, the many, many details I'm gonna be talking about when it comes to leaves, it's just knowing some terminology. So here, this is probably what we often think about when we say a leaf, the main portion, again, of what we would call the leaf is referred to as the leaf blade. Now this, what, again, what we might call the stem of the leaf, the leaf stem, the kind of, technical term, if you will, is the leaf petiole. You may have heard of that term before. And then occasionally, actually more, probably more often than not, there will be another kind of vegetative structure, right, where that leaf stem or petiole attaches to the twig, and that's called a stipule. They look, they're different shapes, different sizes, um, they're present, they're absent, some encircle the whole twig. So again, taking note again of the presence or absence of that or the shape can be helpful. So honing in a little bit more, we've got, again, this is a different kind of drawing. We've got the petiole, right? The leaf stem, the leaf blade. This example here is what we call a simple leaf. So we're getting into leaf complexity now. The Opposite, if you will, of a simple leaf. If you don't have a simple leaf, you're likely looking at what's called a compound leaf. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So if it branches off the twig, petiole, one leaf blade, that's a simple leaf compound. Simple, not a compound leaf. It's a simple leaf in terms of its complexity. Now we're looking at a compound leaf. So. We've got our stem or twig, then where that leaf stem or petiole is, you can see it's not just one leaf blade like we've been looking at. It is many, what is now referred to as leaflets. It's a cute little name, smaller leaves. But this whole piece now is called the leaf. I'm sorry, it, I don't make, yeah. It's just what it is, okay? So this whole thing is the leaf, and now these smaller leaves, if you will, are called leaflets. Leaf, leaflets. And this is considered compound in terms of leaf complexity. There's another, well, there's many forms of, of compound leaves. So this is a similar branching, comes off, but instead of it just being one leaflet, now it's, branching off again. So it's called bi two pinnately compound. Again, this whole thing is then referred to as the leaf and the smaller portions are referred to as the leaflets. The key here, like you might be like wondering, how would I not know that this one of these leaflets is not the leaf itself? The key ingredient, if you will, is the bud. So if you come back down to where the petiole connects to the stem, there's this little structure kind of sticking out. We're gonna look at this a little bit more, but that's referred to as the bud. And that kind of tells you where there is a leaf. You can see at the base of all these leaflets, there's no little structure sticking out. There's no bud, okay? And we're gonna hone into that a little bit more. This is a different type of complexity that we also see. So again, branching off, and there's kind of these cluster of leaves, leaflets. See, I'm even confusing myself. The whole thing referred to as leaf, each of these individually is referred to as a leaflet. Same here, this whole cluster, individual leaflets, whole thing together referred to as the leaf. 
Okay. Now, we're gonna get into leaf arrangement. This is also that special little bud, the key ingredient, if you will, is really important when we're looking at leaf arrangement as well. The nice thing here is there's kind of only three options. So you either have alternate, most common, opposite, less common, world, even less common. So when we're talking about leaf arrangement, it's just simply how the leaves are arranged along the branch or twig. So you can see here, alternate, again, it kind of makes sense once you talk about it. The leaves go from the left side to the right side. They alternate up or down, depending how you're going, the twig. So if you were to connect the leaves, it would make a zigzag pattern. Now, opposite is, just as it suggests, where the leaf or petiole, if you will, connects to the twig, there will be another leaf and petiole directly opposite from it. So it would kind of make like, if you were to connect the leaves, it would just make little horizontal lines going along the twig. Again, the key here, see these little bumps? These are the buds. So again, that's telling you where the individual leaf is attached because it could get confusing if you're just looking at leaflets. I mentioned that opposite is less common. So there's kind of a little acronym to help you remember. Some people say mad dog or just mad. Mad standing for maple, ash, and dogwood. There's a few others, but this is a good start for you. If you find a tree with opposite leaf arrangement, again, the leaves are directly across from one another, that's gonna put you into, it's either a maple tree, an ash tree, a dogwood, there's a few other species, especially when you get into um, plants. We're focusing on trees here today. Again, very, very helpful. Narrows down your options significantly if you find a tree with opposite leaf arrangement. And this is just to kind of highlight what I was saying before, that key ingredient, the bud. So we've got our twig, we've got our leaf stem or our petiole. You can see here the bud. This whole thing is the leaf because if you were to look at, let's use the, the bipinnate example on the right. If you were to just be looking at one of these leaflets, we'll use the one that's circled in orange, and then you came down here and you see another leaflet and you're like, oh, well that's opposite leaf arrangement. I'm gonna say, no, no it's not because there's no bud there. You need to go all the way back, find that bud. And then what you wanna look for is a whole nother leaf, either directly opposite or alternating along the twig. Okay, I'm gonna say, I'm y'all still with me? Anyone? If you made it through leaves, we're, on, we're like almost, I mean, I don't wanna say we're at the home stretch. Okay, Kelly's laughing, so someone's still with me. Here we go. When, the next few things I'm gonna talk about, I'm just gonna let you know, like we're not, I don't expect you to remember all these names. This is just an introduction to the concepts and things that you can look for when it comes to leaves. So there's a whole terminology, a whole language when it comes to the shape of leaves. This is just a sampling what you see on your screen. But for example, needle-like, perhaps you're thinking about a pine tree, right? Pine trees produce needle-like leaves. They will not ever produce a broad leaf, oblong leaf. So the shape of the leaves that you're finding on the tree can be helpful in identification, more so for some species than others, but it's definitely something to take note of. Now, right, what do we say? Never say never, never say always. Again, I'm sorry, this is just the way it is. What you see on your screen are leaves all from the same tree. Okay, so the take home message here is look at many, many, many leaves on your tree. This is a water oak, they're kind of known for this, but it's just something, again, to consider when it comes to observations and tree identification. Never just look at one branch, one twig, one leaf. The thing to note though, again, if we are looking at overall leaf shape, if you were to kind of cut the leaves in half, you would note that the tip of the leaf, the top half of the leaf is wider than the base. 
that might be like, well, who cares? That's very helpful information. So much so that we actually break down leaf shape by basically cutting them in half. The top of the leaf versus the bottom of the leaf. What does it look like? What's the shape? Does it come to a point? Does it have an ouchy point? <laughs> Often think about like hollies. Some of our oak species have what's called a mucronite tip, mucronate, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, but again, just taking note of, does it come to a point? Is it rounded? Does it actually make an indentation at the tip? These again can be very helpful for identification. Same can be said for the base of the leaf. Things again, we probably haven't thought about, haven't considered. Don't want you to remember this terminology. This is again, just for you to start to take note of what these different features look like. I will, however, have you take note of one of these, which is the in, what's called the in equilateral base, which again, once you break it down, kind of makes sense. It basically just means that where the bottom or the base of one side of the leaf, where it attaches to the petiole is higher than where it attaches on the opposite side. So one side will attach you know, here and the other side, the base of the leaf attaches here. So it's in, if they're not equal at the base, in equilateral base. That alone, that information alone can get you, okay, this is either an elm or a birch, again, generally speaking, right? So just that one observation can be critical in narrowing down the species that you're looking at. This is kind of a close up real world visual to show you. So again, you can see, the base of the leaf where it attaches to the petiole, it's higher on this side and much lower on this side. It's on some species, it's very, very obvious. So if you're like having to get out your ruler, if it's not obvious, then we're not in the inequilateral base category. Another thing to take note of when it comes to leaf shape is what's called the leaf margins. So if, if we think about margins right as a piece, piece of paper, it's kind of the edges. Same can be said for a leaf. So on the top left, we have what's called an entire leaf margin. This is the most common that we see. Nothing, nothing really to take note of other than there's nothing really to take note of, which is helpful. <laughs> then we get into all these other fancy leaf margins. There can be revolute margins where they kind of curl in on the underside. If any of you have a sand live oak, they're really known for that. Then we have our serrated leaf edges. If you think back to the, the elm, so you can see how those they are kind of jagged edges. They can get like more broad kind of toothed leaf margin. They call that dentate. You can see the list goes on, but I'd be even willing to bet you all are tree experts already. If I was to ask you, and I will in the uh, chat, the palmately lobed. If I was to ask you what tree has palmately lobed leaves, see? Athena, already. So <laughs> yes, maples, this is the shape that they're known for. So I think my point is that you all already know and are observing a lot of these characteristics, maybe just like unintentionally, or you didn't know they had special terminology to go with them. But again, so that's obviously anything that's palmately lobed, that's very helpful in identifying. Furthermore, we can actually look at the veins on the leaf and how they are arranged on the leaf. So there's parallel, which we often think of grasses when it comes to parallel veins. There's pinnate, which is pinnate and palmate are probably the most common. So pinnate, they're kind of coming, branching out from this mid vein and going out to the edge of the leaf, kind of in a parallel fashion, not always. Palmate, they're all coming out from one central point. So again, we already mentioned maple. Pinnate, if you think, again, sorry, I'm trying not to make you vomit here. So you can see that very clearly here. Again, this is an American elm, which we do have here. You can see these veins very distinctly run out from the mid vein, kind of in this parallel fashion. And then this last category, if any of you have ever seen or explored a dogwood leaf, they have this venation where it kind of goes out to the edge and then curves up towards the top. So if you're seeing any leaf like that, again, it kind of puts you into 
a different category, but just something to take note of. Then one of my favorites, if any of you have been on a guided hike with me, you've experienced this. In terms of the leaf surface, there's a lot to take note of. The texture of the leaf, we'll start there. Is it thick? Is it thin? Is it smooth? Is it rough? Um, and I kind of already got into the thickness. And you'll know that, I mean, sometimes you can tell just by observation, but really holding that leaf will tell you, is it a thin kind of flimsy leaf or is it a pretty sturdy, thick leaf? And these are helpful. Don't just throw that away as like a general observation. Color, this is really, really important, especially when we're comparing the top side of the leaf to the underside of the leaf. So in the example on the screen, this is a magnolia. So think Southern magnolia. Most people are familiar with this. Big showy flower, very large broadleaf, evergreen tree. This tree, you can see this is the same leaf. On the left, we have the top side of the leaf. On the right, we have the underside of the leaf. Totally different colors, totally different texture. So very smooth, often referred to as glabrous, there's all terminology that you'll learn if you dive into this more. The underside of the leaf looks like this because it is covered in a dense mat of tiny, tiny hairs. In um, dendrology, the study of forest plants, we refer to that as pubescence. So this mat of hair, you can often feel with your finger. It just kind of feels like smooth, velvety. Some species, however, it's not as obvious as the magnolia. So as long as you know you don't have poison ivy in your hand, <laughs> one of the tricks we learned in dendrology is if you're ever unsure or just, I don't know, want to experience something, <laughs> you can use your tongue on the underside of the leaf to detect hairs. If, if it works for you, you know, great, you heard it from me. If it's like weird and you're like, no, then you didn't hear it from me. I'm telling you, you will notice right away. It's kind of like, I was trying to think of like an analogy. If you, it's like, think about like peaches, right? They have kind of this fuzzy, maybe you could feel it like slightly with your fingers, they're soft, but the second you bite into that peach, right, you know it's covered in tiny, tiny hairs. So we're getting into all of our senses now. So we've used our tongue. I don't want to say taste, <laughs> but another level of, I guess, our senses in terms of touch. Here, we want to tap into our using our sense of smell. So what you see on your screen, there is sweet gum on the left, which is the native tree species we have here, and our red maple on the right. You can see they look very similar, and I'm sure, hopefully, you're thinking about some of the terminology that we talked about before in terms of the, um, the shape, the margins. You can see the margins on the red maple are more like dentate, right, or lobed. Um, and then if you look at the uh, margins on the sweet gum, it's kind of hard to tell, but they're very, very finely serrated. But if you're ever just like, I don't care about any of that, I just want to know. I just want to crush a leaf and smell it, or rub a leaf and smell it. You will know right away between these two species. So sweet gum has a very aromatic, I like the smell, some people may not. Um, so again, you can either rub the leaf and smell your fingers, or actually crush the leaf and then smell the leaf. And it will give off a very nice smell. Compared to the red maple, where I just say, I don't really know how to describe it. I'm, it just smells like a leaf. <laughs> There's nothing, nothing significant about it. So tap into all of your senses when it comes to leaves. Okay. Yes, and Athena, I see your comment. Yes, that is true on the um, magnolia. So, and that's, again, that's a great point, is that not all of the magnolia leaves always have that distinct coloration on the, under, on the underside. So it's very important to, to take note of many, many things, of which I'm covering today, to really be accurate in your identification. Okay, so we made it through leaves. How are we doing? All right, at least Kelly's still with me. So here we go. We're gonna jump into twigs now. There is, a, again, a, a lot-ish, not as much as leaves, but a few key things that you wanna take note of when it comes to twigs a lot of which are featured in this image and I'm gonna dive into a little bit more. First and foremost, when it comes to twigs, the best place to make an observation, I guess, is on the new growth, which is typically green. So tried to highlight that here. So this is, you know, they're both twigs, but the old growth is kind of 
been brown, it's establishing its bark. Um, whereas the new growth you can see is green. So it's really best to hone in on this, the, the new growth area when you're making these observations. So one thing to note is the buds. <laughs> and I'm gonna show you another picture in a second. So there's um, auxiliary buds, which are on kind of the sides of the leaf. This is either where new growth is gonna happen, potential new growth, it may just remain a bud or it may grow into something. Then there's the terminal bud at the tip of the twig. And it's typically larger than the axillary buds that we um, just mentioned before. Now, how these buds look can be, again, very helpful in identification. They can be scaly, like we see here on the left, or they can be what's referred to as naked, where it's kind of like if you were to rip these <laughs> scales off, what would be remaining, which is this naked bud that you see on the right, which just kind of looks like it looks like new growth that would happen there. There are certain species like this one here that just looking at the bud alone, you could probably identify the tree. So these come in all shapes, all sizes, all colors, all textures. This here on your screen is flowering dogwood. So they have very, very large distinct buds that again, things like this are very helpful this time of year when we don't have leaves to observe, the buds will remain on the tree. Now, this is where like, I don't know, you can totally nerd out if you want. There's something called leaf scars. So as the name may imply, it's where a leaf used to be. So if you have your new growth twig and you were to kind of right at the base of the petiole, that leaf stem, if you were to gently break it off, and I don't encourage you to like go around doing this, but if you have one in hand, the shape of the scar that remains, as well as what's shown on here, these vascular bundles, these kind of circular areas. The number of vascular bundles, as well as the shape of the scar, I'm telling you this because that sounds crazy, but it's very helpful this time of year, can be helpful in identification. So field guides will say leaf, um, leaf scar shape as with, you know, in this case, three vascular bundles. So there's one, two, three distinct areas. These are kind of like the arteries, veins of the tree to kind of share water and nutrients throughout the plant. These are some common leaf scar shapes that you can observe where the, again, where the leaf used to attach to the twig. So some are very, very distinct and obvious. Others, you know, it's just circular and there's not really much to say. Um, but again, just taking note of that is very helpful. Then I alluded to this before in the bark, but just taking note on the presence or absence of lenticels can be very, very helpful. So observing that and taking note. Another thing, if you are one that happens to carry around a pocket knife or have access to one and can use it safely, <laughs> um, you can observe something called the pith, which is kind of the central part of the twig, which is kind of showing you here. So if you were to like shave off to try and get to the middle of the twig. This, you can kind of see it here, I'm gonna give show you another picture, but this darker color in the middle is something called the pith. And there's different types of piths. <laughs> there's um, what's called a diaphragmed pith where it's solid, but there's kind of these little segments or lines breaking it up. There's something called a chambered pith. So it's literally, they're little hollow in, there's little holes, but, it's hollow, segmented, as you can see here. And then there's what's the most common, where is you just shave and it's just a different color, totally solid, a solid pith. So this is what kind of showing you real world, what it would look like if you were to do that. Again, most common is solid. If you get into a chambered pith, that narrows you down significantly. If you get into this, what we call solid diaphragm pith, then again, it's getting you into a very narrow window when you get to any of the two on the left. You can also take note, and this would be pretty obvious, there's very, very few species that have thorns on their twigs, but if you do see those, again, that's gonna significantly narrow down your options for what tree species that you are looking at. So noting presence or absence, and that's kind of all you really need to do for the presence or absence of thorns or spikes. Okay, we're almost there. We're gonna do this thing. Y'all are doing great. Introduction, 
And hopefully you'll be excited to want to explore all these things after this. So when it comes to flowers, I'm not going to get into flower parts. It's kind of, again, the presence, absence, and appearance of flowers and taking note of that if and when they're available. So we've talked a lot about magnolia. They're known for their big, white, showy flowers, right? And that is very helpful in identification. If you see a big, white flower, that's, again, going to kind of get you into a specific category of species that you might be looking at. Compared to what we probably never think of in association with flowers is our oak trees. Believe it or not, they do produce flowers. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have our fruit, right? Our acorns. So taking note of how these are arranged on the tree, are they big and showy, are they small and inconspicuous? How they're arranged, you can, you can really get deep into flowers, which I'm not gonna do today, but the inflorescence type, once there's kind of like a cluster of flowers, the way that that cluster is arranged, there's different terminology that goes with that. So you can take note of that. Again, I'm not gonna dive into it today, it's just something, so for example, B, um, the catkin, that's often what is referred to in association with the oak tree flowers. They appear in a catkin. And we have our fruits and seeds, right? So all these things are gonna be appearing at different times of the year. So depending when you're making your observations, right? You have all these different things to choose from for what you're gonna kind of jot down and note as different characteristics. Different trees produce, produce different fruits. So we have our Samara, our winged Samara, the helicopters that we think about with maple trees. Then we have um, the sweet gum capsule and B on the top right, very distinct fruit. C is our um, pecan. We don't really have them here, but in North Florida. And then again, we mentioned magnolia many times, this very distinct fruit and kind of seed appearance as it, it relates to the magnolia tree. So taking note of what the fruiting body and or the seeds look like for the tree can be helpful, right? You're not gonna have acorns growing on a maple tree. So these, the type of fruit that the tree produces will directly relate to the species that's producing it. Same can be said for our gymnosperms, right? The ones that aren't producing this kind of fleshy fruit, they still have to make seed and reproduce some way. So they have our, their male and female cones and they produce seeds just in a different way. So taking note of the different appearance of these, the size, the shape. I, I could do many sec many presentations just on pines alone, but again, they, they are still producing seeds and taking note of the presence of cones versus fruit can kind of put you into angiosperm versus gymnosperm. If you're looking at gymnosperms, you know, if it has a cone, you're really only looking at a few species, especially here in Florida. Okay, we did it. Yay, okay, and we're on time. I have a few things to kind of wrap up with. Thank you if anyone stayed with me through all of that. <laughs> so to summarize, there is a resource, actually I'm gonna throw it in the chat right now. That was the basis for my presentation really. We've had to update our formatting. Um, so if anybody wants access to what you actually see on your screen, I'm happy to send that out. And maybe I just will to everybody after this, but this is a summary of really everything I just went over that you could have a one pager to take note and remind you of all the different characteristics to look for. And then you basically take this and you get a really good field guide and you use something called, generally referred to as a key, a dichotomous key if you wanna get fancy. And this key will kind of walk you through all these different characteristics that you've now taken note of and ultimately help you to identify the tree that you have. And so I, this is literally like the worst screenshot ever of a key, um, but I just wanna highlight some of the things that are noted in here that we've already reviewed. So it talks about margins being revolute. So curving under again. The leaves are elliptical, oblanceolate or spatulate. So that's referring to the shape of the leaf. Rusty tomentose. So tomentose is another term for the pubescence. Tomentose is like, it's super, super hairy. So again, all these different terms, you can walk yourself through this key, which again is a whole other webinar in itself, but that will ultimately get you to what's on the right. All of these different italicized words are the species that we have. 
that you have now identified based on all the characteristics that you have taken note of. Okay, so we'll just see, and uh, Terry, sorry, I just see your question right now. Yes, there are um, different keys for each season. So depending on what book you have, so mine breaks it up into like summer versus winter keys for the different broad groups. Like the, it's broken down my family for my book, which I will mention, I think after this slide. So I'm curious if anyone wants to chime in, maybe between the whole group, if we can get to four key characteristics that help in identifying trees. Let's see if anyone learned anything today. <laughs> Bark, perfect. Scars. Oh, look at this. Okay, yeah, y'all are great. Range. And yes, Terry, I'm going to share the book, my what I call my Bible for book for tree identification. Flower, simpler compound, habitat. Nailed it. Great. Okay, and yes, so this is, I mean, broadly what we talked about. Again, the range, habitat, bark, leaves, twigs, flowers, fruit and seeds, of which again, each of these could be a whole webinar in itself, really. This, so I already sent, I'll push the link again to the publication that if you just want a summary or kind of dive deeper, if you're more of a learn by reading, the publication I just put in the chat is the same one mentioned on your screen, how to identify a tree. And then this book on your screen is the one that I have. It's, I know you probably won't be able to see, but <laughs> it's mine. It's, it's bookmarked. It's all the things. So very, very helpful. All different keys throughout that guide. And again, there's, there's others, you know, that you're welcome to explore, but this is just the one that I kind of pick and choose that I use in college and just have found it to be great and helpful. So I've stuck with it. And... I want to mention one quick other opportunity. We're doing lots of things for Florida Arbor Day, one of which is we are kicking off. The county is doing a community input series of discussions, literally from now through April, all throughout Pinellas County. You can see it on your screen, all the different opportunities where you can share your thoughts, inputs, experience, perspectives on urban trees. And we'd love to have your input. You can scan the QR code there, or I'll put the link in the chat as well. But please, please check it out if you're interested in kind of voicing your opinion about our trees. And with that, I will say thank you. I'm going to launch a quick poll before I get into the questions. And then we will wrap up. Maybe I'll get into the poll. I won't get into the poll. Julia, yes, here it is. It's already up. Okay. And I'm gonna pull up the Q&A. Okay, so there was a question. Is the poll live? Do y'all see this? Am I crazy? It's live. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I've got too many screens going on. So Michelle was asking the difference between a bud and a stipule. So very good question. The stipule is just simply a vegetative structure that's right where the leaf petiole attaches to the twig. Separate from that will be, it's a totally separate thing, will be the bud. And they look very, very different. The bud could actually grow into a leaf, a flower, a fruit. Um, it could become something. The stipule is just there. <laughs> and then, okay, how can we find out about your tree ID walks in more classes? So thank you, Angeline, for that great plug. <laughs> so a couple ways. One is through... Um, so since I'm based out of Brooker Creek Preserve, a lot of what I do is promoted through their website, brookercreekpreserve.org, as well as their Facebook page. Since I also work for UFI Physics Extension, we have a Facebook page and we often promote our stuff that way as well through that Facebook page. Um, and so you're welcome to sign up for the listserv as well for Brooker Creek Preserve, and you'll get monthly emails with everything we have coming up for the following month. And I'd be remiss if I did not promote <laughs> my podcast that I have called Naturally Florida. So if you're into podcasting at all, we cover all range of topics, not just trees, pretty much all things environment. And they're short 15, 20 minute episodes just once a month, but we'd love to have you as a listener if you're into podcasts. And if you typed a question in the chat, I probably missed it. I'm just looking at the Q and A. So I will scroll through. Otherwise we have one minute left. So if you haven't completed the poll, I appreciate your responses to that. 
Again, check us out for everything we have coming up for Florida Arbor Day. And I'll stick around for a couple minutes, but I'll recognize that it is one o'clock if you have to go. Thank you for tuning in for Lunch and Learn. And I hope to see you at one of our other webinars that we have coming up. Okay, I see, Andrew, what is the purpose of lenticels? So the main purpose is for gas exchange to aid in there. So there's photosynthesis and cellular respiration that's going on. Um, and so it allows to kind of regulate the different exchanges of gases that's going on. Now, again, I, I kind of nerded out a little bit to dive a little bit deeper. And again, there's really nothing to say like why certain species have them and certain species don't. But in terms of their role and function, that's the most accepted. I did see some research that is exploring other possible avenues and purposes of them, but that's what's most accepted right now. Okay, and oh, Sean, yeah, this would be helpful. What kind of data are you hoping to gather from the urban tree discussion sessions and why? That would have been helpful to say. So this is all part of the county, um, which covers unincorporated Pinellas County, is creating their first ever urban forestry master plan to help guide how they're going to manage the urban forest for years to come. And so they want to gather as much public input as they can to help guide their efforts. And I'm happy to chat more about that. Okay. Okay, I think that's the like latest question of just scrolling up as high as I could go in a couple scrolls. Um, okay. Okay. So if you have any other questions, my contact information is there on the screen. You can call me, email me. I'm happy to answer questions that you have. Otherwise, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.